right, let's cut this jazz out. We'll cut this theme short. We've had market reports and weather reports. We've had guys who are newspaper guys on the radio all night long. Let me get, let's get a radio guy in here for a minute, you know? Squeeze a few of us radio people in here. Yeah, you know, I'm curious about that because of this newspaper strike. If you notice on every radio station, there's a nasal sounding columnist. And in my considered opinion, in the Washington of today, it goes on and on and on, and all of a sudden you begin to have, you begin to doubt the newspapers because these guys sound not only so so human, but they also. <laughs> Be careful, fellas. Once you get out from behind that wonderful mask of the printed page, you will be doubted by every man and every boy, Jack, every every last one of us. Because every time, believe me, if you ever heard, if you ever listened to say somebody like, oh, Hemingway talk, you forget about reading them. Uh, it's just the way it is. If you ever find yourself in an argument with J.D. Salinger, you start putting down Caulfield for the rest of your life. Seymour, oh, Seymour, he's got pimples. You know, and uh, you know, it's just, just the way it is. As a matter of fact, you know, I was wondering if there was a radio station strike, fellas. I'm just curious about this, Eddie. What do you think? You're a radio man. If there was a radio station strike, I wonder if the Herald Tribune would give me a, qu a quarter of a page or something to write about what I was going to do on my show that night. You know, you think they would? Yeah. <laughs> just curious about it. You know, whether or not the the. Uh, the uh, whether the Wall Street Journal will have a thing says that uh, yesterday due to the fact you missed the Gene, you missed the Gene Shepherd show last night. Uh, here's a brief synopsis of what Gene would have said had he been on last night. Well, I tell you, I got a pain in the blah, 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 blah. And, and then he sings uh, three brief choruses of Yes, sir, that's my baby. Then uh, I'm just curious. Whether <laughs> I suspect if there was a radio station strike, the newspapers would, with great majesty, completely ignore it. Maybe on page 38 you'd read a little bit of negotiations going on. But radio is in a trauma over a newspaper strike. Fascinating. I hear it everywhere you go. Uh, the, ladies and gentlemen, due to the newspaper strike, we're going to put the news on these days. <laughs> yes, our new expanded coverage. And goes on and on. And it's all the radio stations all up and down the down. In fact, even some television stations are taking notice of the fact that the outside world exists. Some TV stations, and they're putting news on as a very special public service. That's instead. Uh, they take. Uh, they took Priscilla Lane off there for a while, and cut a few of those old King Kong movies out. And uh, you're getting <laughs> the nutty world. I tell you, you know. Uh, speaking of of uh, of the nuttiness of our world, uh, I, the only thing I really miss about the newspapers is that there is a lot of stuff that never seems to sneak through on those very important newscasts that all the very important newscasters do on the radio. I heard one newscaster today. There was a 15-minute newscast, and before the 15-minute newscast came on, the announcer, in a very portentous way, said, And now, in keeping with our expanded news program, instead of the usual seven-and-a-half-second announcements that we put on, the headlines, we have expanded our news coverage to a full 15 minutes to give you news in depth all the way down to the bottom grassroots. And now here he is, our important grassroots reporter, giving you the news of the world and every place else. Well, this guy came on, and this is what happened. The weather in New York is now this kind of weather. The temperature now stands at 23 degrees. Of course, everybody's walking around in it all day long. You know, they know it's cold. So what? This guy goes on for seven and a half minutes. I timed it talking about the weather. He, he squeaks in about a, 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 oh, possibly 40 seconds about Nikita Khrushchev. Made a very, very important speech in the Kremlin, and he skimmed over that quickly in passing, and then for the next four and a half minutes talked about a subway tie-up. And what do you think he wound up his 15-minute in-depth news broadcast with? And now, once again, folks, the weather. The temperature now stands at 20... <laughs> I wish I knew the words to that. You know, that's got such a... Uh, uh, somehow, uh, ever since I've been a little kid, that, uh, I've heard... I don't know a single song. I could not sing the Star Spangled Banner if you pressed me up against the wall and made me sing it, and you would shoot if I didn't. All you'd have to do would be to load up because I'm dead. Uh, I, I don't know one, so I can't even sing the chorus to Happy Birthday. Bring it up. 
To that, except sleepy time, gal. Uh, la da da. Cut that out for crying out loud. No wonder the newspapers ignore us. They do important stuff like Dorothy Kilgall. Tell you all about Lena Horne's new role and all that important stuff that you might have missed. Boy, gee whiz. <laughs> you know, speaking of things you missed, I have, uh, I have a thing that came out of a paper here over in Plainfield the other night. I just thought you ought to know that it's still going on. Speaking of uh, terribly important events and times, this is WOR, AM and FM, New York. The Concern Station. We'll step right in the breach. Those of you who have missed the Daily Inquirer, we'll step right in there. Tell you all about those important things that are happening in the back pages, that are happening in all those little darkened rooms all over New York City with the shades drawn. Yes, know the real story. You, the public, have a right to know. As what is the real Kim Stanley like? Well, listen again tomorrow at the same time. <laughs> Pictures on page 7. While we're on the subject of... Uh, Page seven. Let's get some business out of the way here. Hey, Ma, I got a surprise for you. Guess what? I cooked dinner for you. Huh? Uh, what do you mean? Oh, oh, look at that. Doesn't that look great? You know what that is? That's my lady's cheese blintzes. Eh? Oh, it's, uh, it's cheese, Ma. With like a pasta around it. Oh, no, no. These are my lady's cheese blintzes. They're frozen. See, you just brown them and they're delicious. Aha, ravioli. No, Ma. I can't describe them till you just taste it. Go ahead, taste one. No, Ma. You don't put tomato sauce on them. You put like sour cream or jam or jelly on. Here, try this one with a little sour cream. Just taste that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell you, Ma. Milady's cheese blends is a great. The makers of Milady's blends hope that none of our Swedish friends are offended. Some of our best friends are Swedes. So keep looking for Milady's blends at your frozen food cabinet. And uh, we're now we're now back here in business now. And uh, I I. Uh, <laughs> I must, I must read this exactly the way it came out. You all said in there, Eddie. This is a news note from Wallington, New Jersey. Now, it is true that to many people who live over here in New York, New Jersey is more or less of a mythical state. Uh, New Jersey is more than anything else a state of mind. And uh, those here who live in New York, particularly Manhattan, are fully aware of it. Uh, it's difficult. I remember every morning driving back when we used to broadcast from Carteret. It's difficult to focus on the landscape of New Jersey. Have you noticed that, Ed? It has a tendency to, to look as though it's a little out of focus, particularly between here and the Newark Airport. Very hard to focus on it. And uh, there's, a, there's a certain sense of unreality about it. However, out of this kind of unreality often comes the most blatant and the most, the most poignant reality. Just the way it is. Out of Alice in Wonderland comes some of the greatest truths that English literature knows. It's just the way it is. Wallington, New Jersey. John Cager, 60, of 126 Rutherford Boulevard, Clifton, was hard put to explain to Magistrate Lewis Schiffman in Municipal Court Thursday why his car went out of control and hit a utility pole on Main Avenue Saturday night. Cager's explanation, which he had to repeat because Schiffman said he did not understand it the first time through, was, and listen carefully, was that he was talking to his wife. And suddenly, she stopped talking. This unexpected development, according to Cager, 
caused him to look over to see why she stopped talking. He subsequently lost control of the car, striking a small tree, in addition to the pole in front of the Pavlik Coster VFW home. Huh. That's the best excuse I've heard so far this year, Judge Shipman said. Cager appeared in court with a bandage covering his upper lip, in which four stitches were taken to close a cut resulting from the accident. His wife received one small stitch for a cut over her eye. Judge Schiffman finally acquitted the defendant. <laughs> Break down all again again. And the shape of air will be. Oh, your love belongs to me. At night when you're asleep. Oh, into your tent I'll creep, 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 creep The stars that shine above Will light our way to love You'll rule this land with me oh, I'm the sheep of Araby I wish, uh, you know, that, that crummy record I've got You have a bulletin? Okay from the WOR TV newsroom, noted newspaper columnist George Sikolsky has died in New York City as his, at his apartment. The 69 year old Sikolsky had written a syndicated column since 1944. He also wrote many books during his long career. Stay tuned here to WOR for further details. Now back once again to Gene Shepard. Thank you, Gene. Very interesting guy. I'm sorry to hear that, Ted. I knew uh, Mr. Sikolsky. And uh, very interesting man. I'll tell you one thing I remember about uh, Sikolsky. He was one of the very few. Uh, I've, I've noticed an interesting thing. I notice people who are, are are terribly committed to one political belief or another, some real belief that they hold. They rarely have a sense of humor because of the depth or perhaps because of the tenacity of their commitment. But Sikolsky had a sense of humor, which always surprised me. Very few people I've ever known either on the far conservative side or on the far liberal side. I hate to use the left or the right, but let's say the far conservative or the far liberal. I've rarely found any of those people with any sense of humor at all. And Sikorsky did have a sense of humor. One night, uh, he, he was a member of a club that I was in. Still am, for that matter. The only thing I've ever really joined. And uh, it was a couple of years ago. It was a New Year's party that we were involved in at the Waldorf. And uh, I was I was one of the people who was entertaining, and I and uh, another friend of mine had put me on this thing. Uh, who he was the head of the the program. Uh, he was really the program chairman, John Chapman, the critic, uh, who was a who was a fascinating guy. I don't know if any of you know Chapman, but Chapman is the character. John Chapman is the character that W. C. Fields played. Now that's as close as I can define John Chapman, and I <laughs> he really is. He's one of he's an exceedingly funny man. But Chapman put me on this program, and that night uh, I was at the Waldorf, all dressed up, and it was a, it was a full dress thing with tuxedo and the whole business. I'm up on the stage there, and I'm performing this. And one of the pieces I was doing was uh, was a kind of a satire on the kind of nerve that it takes to do certain things, to really do certain things. Do you realize how much nerve? And I'm going on, I'm talking about this, this really fantastic creative nerve. Uh, I was saying, you know, it's not so much nerve, really, to be an, uh, an airplane pilot or to be a race driver or to be uh, a lion tamer. That's another kind of nerve. But the kind of nerve I'm talking about is the kind of nerve, and there was a long pause, I said, well, like, like, say, to be George Sokolsky. Now, that really takes guts. <laughs> well, who was laughing louder but Sokolsky? You know, people are kind of embarrassed there. Uh, and John was a little embarrassed, like, here, John. But Sikorsky really bopped it up. Very interesting man. Uh, and I'm not saying that I have anything to do with his political attitudes. However, a uh, fascinating guy. You know, uh, speaking of... Uh, of uh, oh, let's get rid of this business here before we go anything uh, go anywhere else tonight. Show. It's all right. Don't worry. We did, we've done the blunts. got the show thing here now. We've got Show Magazine. And uh, it's difficult. In fact, I won't even try to describe the magazine to you. 
I just hope a few of you have a chance to see it on your newsstand. It is one of the most beautiful, comprehensive, well-written, uh, creative magazines about all the arts that I've seen today. Uh, it's the best one around by far. In fact, it's the best magazine that's come out in many years, uh, certainly covering that area. It covers painting. It covers the cinema. It covers uh, the theater, uh, all the arts. And it really has an interesting attitude the viewpoint and the production is magnificent. It's a real treat just to look at this magazine. Now, it's a 75 center. That means that if you were to buy 10 issues, just 10 off of the newsstand, it would cost you seven and a half. But for a short time now, they are going to continue to allow subscriptions for one year at $5.75. $5.75 per one year. Makes a great gift. Just send your name and address and don't uh, just address it to show WOR New York. Send it on a card. Don't send money. They will bill you. Show WOR New York. Put the name of the person to whom you wish it sent. Show WOR New York. Okay. Did I run over? How much? Five seconds? Longer than that? Couldn't have been much longer than that. Ten seconds. Oh, that's all right. They can they can afford that here. <laughs> You know, while I'm on the subject of uh, of this business of, of uh, the kind of nerve that it takes to be people, the other I, I was debating the other night, Ed, as to whether or not to tell the story about the time of the great ice cream war, or whether to tell the time that I got trapped by by Albert Farkas in the A and P. Should I tell you about the time Albert Farkas got me trapped in A and P in the A and P? Well, you know, most of us live lives. All right, I'll tell you that story because uh, it's a story that I, I hadn't really wanted to tell, but I might as well unload. Uh, might as well come right down to the basics now and start telling about some of the rotten sides to my life. Might as well know about it. You know, it's funny. People, I've gotten so many letters from people who will say, how could all of these things have happened to you? How many things have happened to you, you idiot, in the, in the, the 25 years or the 35 years you've been around? Don't try to hide. Let me tell you, a lot of things have happened to you. You're just not admitting it, that's all. Or if you do want to admit it, you can't remember it. For whatever reasons you've got, whatever private reasons you've erased it, or many different reasons. But everybody has lived this, this wild, fantastic life. I know. You know, I sit in a bus, and I look at people, and I would like to know the things that have happened to them. I would like to have seen the wild things that they have seen. <laughs> I've only seen the stuff that I've seen, you see, and it's only one life, and it's not enough. And I look at these people on the bus, and I wonder, you know, and, I, and then, then when I ask them about things, I say, well, I don't know. You say, well, whatever has happened to you, Clarence? Well, I went to a party once. Oh, Clarence, for crying out loud, Clarence, and you can see you can see the creases of, of care and anxiety around his eyeballs. You can see old wounds in the knee, and he only remembers that he went to a party once. Well, this is just the way it is with people. I don't know what it is. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm curious about that phase of our of our being. But and oh, another question that is always asked me wherever I go, if I'm speaking in place, and somebody comes. Hey, Shepard, them, all them things really happen to you. Yes. And my life is not unique. It is only unique in that I never became president. I never never made it big, anything. You know, I'm here just like everybody else, you know. And, and the thing is, most people, I said, well, now, look, did you ever fall down the stairs and hit your head in the basement, Charlie? Well, yeah. Well, what happened that time? Yeah, I got a bump. Oh, Charlie, you missed the point. Come on, will you get with it? You want to grab him by the neck, you know, by the ears, and shake him till his eyeballs rattle. Most people make no, uh, come to no conclusion. I, I've got this friend, believe me, I've got this friend who, who was at Anzio. This guy was not only at Anzio, he was one of the first soldiers over the bridge at Remagen. This guy was one of the first guys to enter Berlin. <laughs> this guy... This guy was at a university when there was a bomb plot discovered to blow up the administration building by one of the fraternities. 
Well, the other day, I'm sitting there talking to him, and I said, you know, the name will be, will be concealed here under a cloud of dust so that he doesn't... <laughs> I said, you know, you know, Howard, you know, Howard, you have lived a wild life, Howard, and I never hear you talk about it. And Howard says to me, he looks me right in the eye, he says, what do you mean? Nothing ever happened to me. I say, Howard, you were at Anzio. You were at Raymogen. They blew up the administration building. You were one of the guys that caught the guy with the bomb. Oh, well, that's nothing. All right. So what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> oh, well, all right. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I think what it is, is it, it takes a certain amount of, a certain amount of something to, to ever really ex examine your life as you would examine a tapestry. And then to look at it and say, oh, for crying out loud, I see you. I see what, was, what, what that thing's about now. Well, one time, we all learn terror, you know. We all have a sneaking feeling of cowardice, too, about ourselves. There isn't, isn't a man alive or a woman alive who is not in one way or another a coward. Now, this is related to a thing that nature installed in you before you even knew anything was being installed in you that had to do with the preservation of your own skin. It's the law of self-preservation. Well, I don't know whether girls ever have a chance to feel terror, Ed. I don't think girls are are often... Now, I know immediately somebody's going to talk, write to me and tell me about the time she was chased home by somebody. Yes, that's true. You probably were. But... And I'm not arguing, but I'm just saying that the kind of life that women lead in the United States, particularly young girls, it is not conducive to the kind of raw, stark, sheer terror that male-type kids often find themselves confronted with. Now, I'm talking about the kind of terror that leads to abject cowardice. Now, I will explain. Everybody looks at me saying, well, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, girls are not often asked to slug it out toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Boys are often forced into it. Now, do you see what I'm saying there? Now, you're going to tell me... Now, when I say cowardice, I'm not talking about the thing that, that is suddenly thrust upon you that is unavoidable that you have no choice in. Like, for example, if a car is bearing down on you, everyone has known this kind of terror. That's not the kind of terror I'm talking about. I'm talking about voluntary terror. <laughs> you know the kind of terror when, when, you're, when you're sitting in the stand, say, and, and there's a guy 27 seats away from you, and you're at the football game, and the guy's hollering for, for somebody else. You know, he's hollering, oh, way out. And all of a sudden you holler over, it, oh, shut up, you bum. And the next thing you know, he's getting up, and he's going to fight it out with you. Well, now, this is not often happening to chicks. That I know of. I have not seen it happen often at Chicks. It probably does. But I have not seen it often happen. Well, let me tell you about the time Farkas trapped me at the A&P. You want to know about that? Well, all right. This is the kind of situation. Now, the, the Chicks don't have to listen. I will just tell you, this is for the benefit of the male types who are listening because they will recognize the scene immediately. I am in sixth grade. Now, sixth grade is an interesting time of life, really, because this is the time when... Kids are really beginning to assume the personalities that will later pursue them all through their lives, like a shadow, like the hounds of hell nipping at their hocks. Whatever it is they're in the sixth grade, they will be pretty much by the time they're 105, with limited changes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Now, up to that time, they're just all kids, you know? They're just all flubbing around at kids. Uh, and about the time a kid gets into third or fourth grade, he's beginning to learn a few tricks, or he's not learning a few tricks. <laughs> Or the kids, by the time they're in the third grade, are, are starting to take other kids, or they are being taken. It's a funny thing. Yeah, this is the way it is. The little aggressive leaders are beginning to pop out. Uh, guys are beginning to already sulk in the corner by the water cooler. You know, they're going to be sulking in the corner by the, by the water cooler when they're working at Benton and Bowles 20 years after that. Same guy. Same reason, too. The same look on a face. The same sobbing in the subway whole bit, you know. He hadn't changed the thing. Now, now the, the same kid at the, in, in third grade is already scared of girls. He's, he's scared. They, 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 he goes to the party. He screams and yells and hollers all the way. There are seven kids who are running to the party for to see the girls. Same thing. Twenty years later, the same guy's still scared of girls. And now he's taken wearing big fuzzy sweaters, you know, and writing angry plays. 
right. So, so you got you got the bit. See, it's all going along, and, and so it's funny. By the time they're in sixth grade, though, now they are beginning to act on it. You see, they're beginning to act on it. Now, up to this point, they were just little overt signs that were beginning to show. Sixth grade suddenly arrives, and things are beginning to happen. Well, there was the only genuine juvenile, what we would call today, juvenile delinquent that I knew of in our school was in my class, and his name was Albert Farkas. Well, <laughs> Farkas was one of these sandy, scruffly people. You know the kind of guy with a sort of sandy hair? He's got kind of freckle, scruffly, uh, rough, uh, kind of chunky, beefy kid, uh, small eyes like a pig, uh, kind of kind of blonde eyebrows and eyelashes. Didn't look like he had any. He had a short, fat neck. And this was a kid who was not aggressive in the sense of, of being sneaky and aggressive, you know, a sneaky, aggressive kid. This kid was a bull. He was a very violent, physical kid, and he was very good on football teams, that kind of stuff. But the only trouble was he was not at all interested in playing with anybody else other the kids. He was interested in being with this little bunch of cronies. Now, very early in life, Eddie, you know this, that if there is a tough kid that can knock all the other kids down, he begins to he begins to gather around him kids who, because of the fact they are afraid of him, hide behind him. They stand next to him and say, Ah, oh, boy, out of boy, Al, hi, oh, really, out of boy, Al, hi, Al. In short, they, there are cronies immediately begin to assemble. You will find this in businesses. Wherever there is a big, tough, rough, aggressive, behind him you will find four or five scared men who are the cronies for this guy. It's just that way. He uses them for his ego. He loves to have them around patting them on the back, laughing at his jokes. Uh, he loves to have, he loves to hit him, you know, once in a while. Ah, oh, you old son of a gun. He hits him. And the guy shugs. His teeth flop, you know, his false teeth jiggle. Uh, but he's there. He's, he's there to be punched. And uh, have you ever noticed the secret thrill that many a movie star feels when a gangster puts his arm around them? A dozen movie stars who love to be seen in the company of, of Lucky Luciano and guys like Frank. It's just the same thing, you know. So, so you, you got all this uh, that, 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 the, that the aggressive, unlawful guy is a very attractive guy in a strange way. A lot of people are attracted to Castro because of his violence. Now, they will tell you they're attracted because, quote, he's a peaceful man who is looking for an eternal salvation and a beautiful paradise. A bunk. He's a violent man. If he had looked like Wally Cox, this same crowd wouldn't follow him. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting way. And by the way, the people who are attracted to violence are almost invariably the least violent people. That's why they are attracted to it. Because we all have a secret desire to be tough, rough, and the leader. We all have a secret desire to be on top of the heap. We do. We're just that kind of creature. Now, many of us know we can't be on top of the heap, so what do we do? We begin to attack those who do get to the top of the heap. It makes us feel a little better to attack the man who is the thing that we aren't. It's like little thin guys with glasses always put down halfbacks, invariably. Well, let me tell you, given a chance to be recreated, I, I know not one little thin guy who would say, I want to be a little thin guy with glasses if you're going to make me over again. <laughs> oh, yeah, in a pig's ear. I know. So, so, so you got this problem going. Well, Farkas, already at the age of, well, whatever you are in sixth grade, I knew it was sixth grade because Miss Robinette was our teacher. She played a little bit into the this, into this scene here. Well, whatever you are, it's, what are you at sixth grade? You're about, what, 10, 12, something? No, you're not 12, no, about 10, 11. 10, 11, 12, about 12. Between 11 and 12, something like that. You're old enough to, 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 be, pretty, to be pretty dangerous and uh, young enough to know you are. And so here we are, you see, and old Farkas was already, he was the only guy I knew in class who was a truly violent man. Harold Dill was not. Harold Dill was a bully. Farkas was not a bully. Now, many violent people are not bullies. Farkas was not a bully. Farkas was just tough. And Farkas never really directed his anger at other kids. It was interesting. Oh, I remember one time, the only time I ever saw a thing like this happen in class. You know, you keep reading about it now, but this guy was obviously ahead of his time. Farkas one time jumped up in Miss Nelson's class. There was a little ruckus going on, 
And Farkas took a handful of pencils, just grabbed a whole bunch of pencils, you know, like out of a desk, and he, he threw the pencils up against the blackboard in the front. Pow! About 25 pencils. Bang! Like that. He just threw them. Of course, all the kids are sitting there. Wow! Farkas is throwing a fit. Farkas throws the pencils across. He swears. He swears. Bellows it out, you see. And Miss Nelson comes tearing across the room, you know, and tries to grab Farkas. And Farkas reaches over, and she was carrying a pointer. Farkas grabs the pointer and busts it. And he threw the pointer down, and he rushed up to the front of the class, and he's hollering, You're not going to let me do it! Well, with that, Miss Nelson starts to cry. And Farkas is yelling, and of course we're all sitting there. Miss Nelson is crying. Farkas is running around the room, and he runs around the room about twice with steam coming out of his ears, and he hooped right out the door. Well, of course, Miss Nelson was crying and weeping and hollering, and all the kids are sitting there were just sweating, you know, our feet are sweating and everything. I really, wow. And, and Miss Nelson was a pretty tough teacher. Miss Nelson walks to the front of the class and goes right out the room, weeping and hollering. We all felt rotten, you know, all very embarrassed, you know. You know, teachers, she's weeping and hollering. She goes down the hall. We could hear her weeping, and we could hear we could hear Farkas hollering down the hall. He was hollering in one direction. Miss Nelson was crying in the next. So it was that kind of a situation. All right. You got Farkas. So, so Farkas, Farkas had about four or five guys that hung around with him all the time. Well, I don't know what it was. I don't know what, what, why, why it is. There is a look in my eye or something that makes the, the, uh, the angry bull-like people, makes the hackles rise. I don't know what it is about me. I don't know, you know, just like, even at that age, I don't know what it is. I have been fired from, from, from radio stations just because of the bull of the woods would walk down the hall one time and look me in the eye. He said, get rid of that son of a pimp pal. Out he goes. And I haven't done anything, and I've never missed. The next thing I know, I'm out. Well, it's because of the look in the eye. I don't know what it is. So one day, I'll tell you what happens. This is the way I see. I'm coming home from school. I'm about 20 or 30 minutes late for some reason or other. I know that I was by myself, which was kind of unusual. You know, kids come home with six or eight guys together. I'm coming home by myself. Just me. Well, I'm walking down the street. I've got about six blocks to go. The, the school at this point that I was going to was all the way across town from where I lived. Well, I got about six or eight blocks to go, which is a good long trip out there because these are really big blocks. It's like a mile, more, maybe even more than that. So I'm just sort of flubbing along. I'm walking. And I got a book, you know, or something, and I'm just clunking along. And I, I pass an alley. I remember distinctly, I pass an alley, and I see Farkas. Farkas and these four guys. Well, Farkas is about, oh, he's about 75 or 100 feet away from me. So Farkas looks and he says, Hey, Shepard! Well, I look at Farkas. Farkas has hardly ever said anything to me up to this point. You know, Farkas is always on his, his name starts with an F. Mine starts with an S. I'm on the other side of the room. I never see this. You know, I just see him from a distance. So he says, Hey, Shepard! And I look down there. I said, What do you want? He says, You know what we want. I said, what? Well, immediately, of course, I knew what they wanted. They wanted to knock my block off. That's all. Just out of sheer knocking block off passion, you know? So I looked down there, and immediately I knew that this was their tog. I knew that it had come. Well, Farkas and the four or five guys start coming. Well, I took off like a speckled bird. Well, one thing I was. I might have been a lot of, a lot of things I wasn't. There were many things I was not. But one thing I really was, I could move. I'll tell you, I moved like a shot. Well, old Shepherd goes ripping up the street, and I knew I had about eight or nine or ten blocks to go towards the house. I was not going to make the house. I knew this. The only chance that I had, since there was about five of them, was to, was to try to do what we called in the Army later evasive course, evasive tactics. Keep a moving target and never give them an expected target. So I run like mad about, about 75 yards, and I turn right. I cut over about four or five lawns up through a house, back down over the lawn, over the back porch, and I'm down, I'm running down the alley. Well, I can hear these guys hollering behind me, Farkas and his, and his four or five guys. Well, now, these guys were pretty good, too, obviously. They were wiry. See, I was running up against my contemporaries. They had had as much work out in the, in the yard as I had. I just had a 75-yard or maybe a 75-foot start. I'm running. Well, I'm running. I'm running. 
I'm going like man, and you know, your heart. Not only am I getting, you know, it's it's a it's a wild run, but my heart is popping, you know, because I'm scared to death. There's these guys. I I knew they were going to get me one day, you know, these guys. So I'm running and running. I go, I go running back, and I run past. There was a long warehouse. Well, this warehouse was a long, narrow wooden structure with railroad tracks. Well, I, I made a terrible mistake. I got on these doggone railroad tracks. Well, I don't know whether you've ever tried to run along ties and railroad tracks, like as fast as you can. Well, I'm running, and I'm stumbling and running like mad along this warehouse, and I could see these guys behind me, and they're catching up. They're running like mad because one guy would fall, but three of them wouldn't. And the other guy, so I'm going and going, and I just get to the corner of the warehouse. They're about ten feet, and I turn left again, and I'm riding down this alley, up and down and up through stairs, up past the water tower, and by now I'm going out of my skull. Well, I've run for about, uh, oh, I'd say a half an hour. And I, I'm telling you a half an hour. These guys, they just wanted to do it today. And I was the first guy along, you know. I, you know. So I'm tearing down Kennedy Street. Well, there is an A&P there. And this, this was probably the cucks of the situation. I come tearing past the A&P, and the A&P was a haven suddenly. The A&P meant something. So I turned into the A&P. I run boom, 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 right into the A&P. I go tearing back to the frozen food department or whatever it was back there with the meats. And I'm, I'm back there like I'm sweating. And there's a lot of people. You know, it's the A&P. So I come tearing in there. And I stand back. And I knew these people. I had shopped there with my mother and so on since like I was about six months old. But I am out of my absolute skull. With being scared, and I felt terrible craven. I felt like a coward. I felt all the terrible, rotten things that many a guy feels in the executive washroom this very day, right after he has left the meeting, and he knows he should have, should have said something when they fired poor old Fred, but he hasn't. He never will. And in fact, he applauded. He cheered. And now he's in the he's in the john, and he's being sick to his stomach. Well, I felt like that because I knew I you know you, you just don't run when you're a kid. You don't admit it. You don't run. Well, I'm I'm in I'm in the meat department, and and of course there were four or five shoppers around there, and the guy in the meat department knew me, and he says, "What do you want, kid?" <laughs> I'm just looking. <laughs> I'm looking around. Well, he sees obviously something is wrong, but he is playing it cool. He's not saying anything, so I'm pretending like I'm <laughs> I'm looking at the oatmeal boxes. <laughs> I walk around, and I'm trying to look out to see a Farkas in that crowd, and I see him out in the front. They're looking in through the glass, and there's a big, you know, the big signs that say 49 cents, lamb roast, and all that. These guys are looking in through the signs. They're just looking in. Oh, boy, it's terrible. I can see him now, and I'm looking out through the NP, and they're waiting outside for me. And it's, it's, it's getting later and later. And for some reason or other, which I will never explain, my left foot started to wiggle. It was a nervous reaction. It's jiggling up and down. I couldn't stop my foot. It's jumping up and down. It's a terrible nervous tick. And the guy behind the counter hollers, Hey, what's the matter, kitty? You got to go? I says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know they had a John in the NP. So he sends me to the John in the NP, and I see that there's a back door. I go tearing out through the back where they had the cartons, out the back door. Five minutes later, I'm in the house, and I'm sitting there looking out. The next day, Farkas said not a word.